got my volunteers in place and everything. We're going to try something here because we're from Texas Tech. We like flying without a net. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not exactly sure about how time is going to go. I'm John Chandler, by the way. I'm uh, director of the Texas Tech T-STEM Center. And my lovely compadre here is Delilah Holder. Uh, she's new with the center and she's a firecracker. Uh, we're going to just kind of swap in and out of this thing. We'll uh, over, you want to go over what we're, our takeaways? Okay, yeah. Okay. We can get up, but maybe not. Yeah. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be we're going to be making a video today, looking at the advantages of using video in the classroom. We're going to uh, look at other uses for video projects that you can do. We're going to do some sample. We're going to show you some sample classroom videos. And we're going to give you some tools so that you can go back and you are fully equipped to be able to start your projects. All right. So, you guys ready to shoot one? And like I said, I'm concerned about the time with this. So, I told Delilah if we hit 10 minutes into this thing, just cut us off wherever we're at. And we certainly don't have time to put it into, into the movie maker or whatever. But we'll go over some of the tools too. Can I have my volunteers up here, please? Yay! I need a cameraman. Will you be my cameraman? I will certainly try. All right. Let's see. <laughs> now, what we're going to start off with her narration, all right? And then you guys come in on your parts. Oh, I need one because there's a part I'm going to do. I'm going to do the boss. Because he's going to have this part. Uh, That's stretching. There's one part where there's an audience participation component. So when you hear the narrator say, the birds are singing, everybody goes, <laughs> I didn't even have to tell you what to say. All right. Well, welcome to the Metro Goldwyn Chandler Productions. This is this is taken from a case study we used to do for our physics and sound workshop, and you know we did it with teachers, and teachers are they're okay with case studies, but what we found is like as an engagement piece, you can't beat having kids actually participate in the video itself. And I I was sort of writing this one last night, so. You know, we'll have to forgive him for the script. All right, so uh, we'll start with the narrator and lights, camera, action. Next to the Lubbock Symphony uh, building in Lubbock, Texas, is what used to be a very ugly vacant lot. It is a beautifully new grand garden atrium area that was built with city development grant to help beautify Lubbock. The Symphony Board of Directors is currently soliciting a uh, uh, RFPs to construct what they describe as an aesthetic wind chime installation. Firms bidding on the project and required to present, are required to present a bid package to the board that includes a working prototype, a final set of construct construction specifications and plans, and their bid for what they will change to finish the project or charge to finish the project. Sorry, I still need my glasses. <laughs> now I'll tell you. A significant problem with the project is that time is running out on the grant. Sound familiar? Today is Monday, and any expectations not uncovered by next Monday go back to the, go back to the city. Expenditures. <laughs> Consequently, the board has scheduled a meeting on Friday to hear presentations from bids bidding on from firms bidding on the project. After the presentations, the board plans to select the winning design and award a contract to encumber the funds in time. Smithers is an engineer with the firm planning to submit a bid and is on his way to meet with a member of the Symphony Board and their business manager. On the way out the door, the boss said, Smithers, I'm counting on you to find out everything we need to know because we could easily lose our shirts on this one. In the new garden at the Symphony office, Smithers is seated across from a very wealthy looking old lady. I think I resent that. The birds are singing. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Von Flatland. I appreciate you giving me this time to get a better idea of what you are looking for in an aesthetic wind chime installation. No trouble at all, dear boy. I must say, you look very clean cut for an artist. Actually, I'm an engineer. Well, don't feel bad, young man. The most artists I know have good, have second jobs to make ends meet. And after all, <laughs> someone must drive the train. <laughs> oh, I suppose. Tell me, what do you envision this installation will look like? Uh, and what will it be used for? 
Well, I have always imagined a beautiful piece of kinetic sculpture that signs to us during intermissions. Oh, I hope it sings in the key of F major because it's my favorite sound. Oh, and it must harness our wonderful West Texas wind, perhaps recalling the sturdy prairie schooners that brought our first settlers to our beautiful West Texas. Hi, you must be Smithers. I'm Harrison, General Manager of the Sympathy. How was your visit with Miss Van Flatland? Did she fill you in on everything you need to know? I'm not sure what I learned from her, to tell you the truth. <laughs> she means well, and has been a very good and loyal friend of the Sympathy over the years. Look, I know you have all the same questions as everyone else about the project, so let me just fill you in. When we get the grant to clean up the lot and plant the garden, we envisioned a nice atrium area that patrons could come out to during intermissions, that we could use for receptions and fundraiser events. The board originally wanted to commission a kin kinetic sculpture, but to tell you the truth, all the artists that we tried to get involved wanted a small fortune, certainly well out of our budget, and they wanted way more time than we had for this project. Now our back is up against the wall because we are in danger of leaving the rest of the grant money on the table and winding up with nothing. For your proposal, I can tell you that the board will be happy with just a large windmill chime somewhere around four feet tall that we can install as a permanent fixture in the garden. We all realize that the time is a huge problem with this project and everyone is in the same boat as you are. Just to be conservative and give us the best wind chime that you can build and install for under fifteen thousand. Well, what about Miss Van Flatland? Won't she be disappointed? Deep down, she knows that not going to see the grandiose sculpture that she talks about. But I can tell you this: everyone around in your design will go down well with the board. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you. Cut. All right, as I said, we, we sort of took this from a case study, and I, I kind of wrote it up last night. I noticed a few typos, and I, I hate putting people on a spot to read because I could never read. Uh, but anyway, in that little video, let's try to unpack some of there, There's a whole lot of information in there, you know, and the <coughs> assignment that we give our teachers is that they're going to construct a wind chime. What else was in there? What were some other things that we need to know about this wind chime that are just packed into that thing. Four foot tall. Four foot tall. Yeah, it's got a budget. Uh, key of F, yeah. Uh, what about Miss Flatlander's request? That was one of Miss Von Flatlander, the key of F. She loves that key. Yeah, that that it'd be it have some sort of unusual aesthetic kind of mechanism, perhaps. And really, we could go on and on with this. But really, you know, you talk about an engagement piece, you know, having the kids pick out little stuff from, from that, you know, and having them participate. And, you know, you can do all sorts of things to get all the other ones that are sitting there, you know, that aren't characters. I try to come up with a lot of little parts, you know. But, but you know, it could be a dark and stormy night, and you have a light flicker, and everybody's thunder noisy and all, all that sort of thing. But... You know, it gets them involved in, and, and just the act of having to pick out, you know, those things of what do we know and what do we need to find out, I think are, are, are key to getting kids in, in, involved and engaged in a project immediately, you know. Uh, what are things that, what do we know, what do we need to find out? Who knows what notes comprise an F chord? Well, you got a, yeah, you got a major note and you got a third and a fifth or something like that. I uh, forgot all my music, even though I had a misspent use of playing a rock and roll band. Anyway, you know, these are the things they're going to have to find out. And we're going to have to teach some components in this, you know. And uh, actually, the physics of sound is one of the hardest things to teach. You know, I mean, the resonance and things like that. I mean, I'm for you physics teachers here. And, you know, and the formulas aren't necessarily easy to determine where the nodes are, where you're going to hang these things. And I always try to throw in... You know, because one of the things I love about the engineering design process is that, you know, it's a way to solve open-ended problems, and I want kids to understand that. But, you know, one of the things you do is you try to understand as much as you can about the project in its context, because they all have their own context, you know. And then 
what are all the possibilities? You know, you come up with a set of requirements, you know, based on what we pick out of this and what we learn about what comprises the F chord, that sort of thing. And uh, then we come up with what are all the possibilities we can possibly have for this thing. And they've got to come up with some kind of metric of their own, usually, to winnow out the poorer choices and, you know, let the cream rise to the top, have, have you know, make the best design choices they can in this thing. And, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, I mean, you can do, like, to, I, can, I can objectively, you know, come up with a metric to tell me if I'm hitting my, if I'm hitting my notes on my, on my, on my tubes or not, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I can, I can hook up a microphone to an oscilloscope and measure those frequencies. I know exactly, you know, whether it's ringing those tubes or not. I can make the measurements they made, uh, you know, and check their calculations, you know, in, in the formulas for, for determining the pipe length, uh, you know, to, to get a certain, you know, note or frequency out of, out of a certain size piece of pipe. You know, those are all objective things that are readily done, but how do you measure that aesthetic in there? And, you know, I mean, towards the end, the guy almost says, you know, we love old Miss Von Flatlander around here, and, you know, the board's going to look favorably on anything you can do that, you know, is a nod towards her vision, you know? Uh, I tell you what, teachers are the worst ones in the world when we, when we give those problems. You know, I always like to kind of throw those little things into the videos. Uh, that doesn't take much thinking usually because I come up with them. But I mean, here again, they have to determine, you know, how much time and effort they're going to put in on this aesthetic component. Because the guy's already said you don't have to do any of it, you know. Just make me standard old wind chimes. You know, I don't fit the requirements. But I guarantee you teachers will go over back and forth. Like we usually give them, you know, like, they'll have two days in our workshop. We usually give them a little budget, you know, like five or ten dollars to spend. And every bit of that money is spent on aesthetics, you know. And one of these days I'm afraid they're going to have, like, this giant windmill is going to show up, you know, and it'll dong, dong every time it goes around. <laughs> but at any rate, this is what we want to do. Now, the entry piece is not the only use of video, but, you know, there are a lot of good reasons to use it right up front and to use it all the way along to the project, if you like. Uh, so Dr. Chandler went through how you can use uh, this as an entry document, but we wanted to go over and give you some more reasons why. We know with engagement that this is a great way to grab our students' attention, but there's some other really great reasons that we need to be using video in our classrooms. One thing is we have never had a generation so closely tied to technology. Um, our teens right now are known as the Facebook generation or the digital native generation. There was a study done by the Kaiser Family Foundation and they said that, and this is a, I would say this is pretty conservative, that students spend about seven hours a day doing some type of digital media. They are looking on the Facebook, they are tweeting, they are on the internet, they are on their phones, they're texting, they're doing all of those things. Um, we know that about 30, no, let me see, I think they said that there were th uh, three-fourths of all teenagers now have cell phones. And I guarantee you they're better than the cell phones that I have, okay? And they're doing all these wonderful things. They use their cell phones about 60 times a day. And again, they're tweeting, they're texting, they're using them to surf the internet, to find information. A lot of our schools have bring your own technology. And they're taking their technology, their phones, and they're using them in the classrooms. So we know that this is the way that our students are learning. And so we need to make sure that we are giving them a pathway to be able to uh, express and, and use all of that knowledge that they have. Another thing is with 21st century skills, we have been charged with teaching 21st century skills. Those are very difficult to assess on a state assessment or with our regular classroom instruction that we give. It's very difficult to see the job that we're doing on teaching those 21st century skills. Those skills of collaboration, of communication, all of those. Those are the skills that are going to help you the most when you get out into the real world. You need to have your content knowledge but if you can't work with groups, if you can't communicate your ideas, then you're going to have some significant difficulties. We know that. Also with Bloom's Digital Taxonomy. We all know about Bloom's Taxonomy. We've used it for years and years and years. But there's a Digital Taxonomy, and I'm sure you know about this one, but at the very top of the Digital Taxonomy, these are the skills, these are the activities that students need to be able to do. 
as it rises to the higher level thinking. At the very top is creating, and creating videos is right up there. Okay, so by giving our kids the opportunity to create videos, we are giving them those those um, outlets for higher level creative problem solving <laughs> with uh, content retention. See, I'm giving you a plethora of good stuff to take back. If anybody asks you why you're using videos, you can just shoot this stuff out of. With retention, did you know that um, studies have shown that it, um, they took a group of students, they taught them something, they went back three days later. With those that had just been taught orally, they only remembered about 10%. With those that were taught visually, they were able to remember about 35%. But those that were taught with a visual and an auditory, such as like with a video, my friends, they remembered 65% of the content that had been taught to them. So it's going to help our students with the retention. And then with engagement. When I was a teacher, I was a Polynesian fire chef. Let me guarantee you. I was dazzling and wonderful and woo, out there. It was something. But I still had kids that were difficult to, why are we doing this? And then the, the ones that are like a little bit groggy. I'm like, sweeties, unless you have a diagnosis for narcolepsy, you better wake yourself up. I'll make you do a 504 plan and we'll go on from here. But so with that, if we are not very careful, we do not want our classrooms to look like this. And we know this, friend. I'm sorry, we're having a little bit of volume problems. I'm sorry. But you know this. In 1930, the Republican controlled House of That's Ben Stein. Anyone? Anyone? Great depression. <laughs> Have we been there? Anybody? Anyone? giving us the stink eye while we're trying to teach. So, let me see if I can get this off. So, Dr. Chandler has some video sample entry uh, documents for you and other kinds of videos. And I'll continue to try to work with our sound. Oh, okay, and so yeah. We can get that up to an audible level. I'll, I'll raise every level I can find on the thing. Uh, oh, well, we'll just we'll live with it. You can, be, you can move closer. We will fight. Uh, well, you know, yeah. one, one of my big reasons for, for using videos and having them use videos completely throughout the thing is that, you know, the kind of organizational skills and, and you know, the, the developing a, a script and developing a sequence of logic and all that sort of, those are all writing like skills. Except, it's not as drudgery as, you know, like, I sit there and stare at them. If I know I have two weeks to write something, I can, for, you know, like, a week and, and six days I can stare at a blank screen and not ever get anything down, you know, and then that last day I, I flurry, you know. Well, I think our students have all the same problems that, you know, and I hate to say this, but in my opinion, one what, what of the legacies of standardized testing is this idea that there's an answer to everything, you know, that there's one correct answer and, you know, the teacher knows it, you know, <laughs> and I got to just remember what that is. Those kids are sitting there, they're waiting for that answer to drop out and don't think they're not good at and spotting a little emphasis in your voice or whatever. But here again, I do this with engineering students at the university level, you know. I get interested in their projects, you know, and, and ask them, you know, where'd that come from? How did you come, how did you, you know, work that out? And they look at me like I'm accusing them of plagiarism, you know, getting it off the internet or something. I, no, I mean, that's just I'm interested. But we're not used to having them articulate what they're doing and their thought processes. And this is an easy way to get them to do that, you know. Because in, in, their, in their design projects, they make all these design choices. I mean, they make the choices. They design the thing. But if you ask them about it, they give you this deer in the headlights look. You know, they, they have a difficult time sort of going back and articulating, you know, kind of backtracking, how did I really arrive at that? And you usually get a little fluff piece out of them, you know, if you make them write it down. And I always make them write lots of stuff. They love me for that. Uh, these are some sample entries. And you guys feel free to chime in on, on what you think is good about them, what you think is bad about them. Uh, we, we've taken these from several of our, our uh, workshops. Let's do this straight first. This, I have to tell you, this was a middle school uh, math teacher, and we had a little bit of money back in these days. We busted a move and gave them all iPods, you know, video iPods, 
to do podcasts with, and she didn't want it. She refused her iPod. I had to beg her to take her iPod. Uh, she eventually did, but I don't. I, whether she ever used it or not is a mystery to me. But she was that adverse to technology. But you know, we made them do a video for you know a class in their upcoming uh, to introduce some topic in the upcoming semester. Go ahead. Okay. Hang that one. Because she put so much effort into this thing. Yeah. <laughs> So, what, what was the assignment, do you think? What are they doing there? <coughs> well, they're making a mobile, right? That's what it looks like. And that's what they're, and this is an assignment she just traditionally done. And essentially, you know, that a mobile's got to kind of balance out, right? And, you know, she has to make a circle and a square that have the exact same area, so they balance, you know? And she shows them, you know, alternate ways of, computing that, you know, with a little, you know, graph paper or model or whatever, you know, and, and the math's usually scalable in anything we do, you know, I've, I've found anyway. We do a lot of rockets and I can have, you know, elementary kids figure an area under a curve, you know, and they, they're a long way from calculus yet. Let's do it. Uh, anybody have any comments on that one or questions about it? She essentially made those little cutouts and did a stop motion. She, we had her tripod and set it up like that and she moved it and took a click and Moved it, took a click. I mean, it was, oh, it was tedious. And this was the lady that hated technology. Probably hated it even more after she finished that thing. But so, you know, I was really kind of proud of her for doing that. Take me, anyone you like. some of the tools, yeah, you, you, I probably need to like preface some of this with like, some of these things are 10 years old. I mean, we did them in, in workshops a long time ago, you know, we, we uh, you know, try to always try, try to bring in useful ways to use the technology. Because here again, let's face it, yeah, you know, I mean, we don't want to just use technology for technology's sake, you know, I mean, you know, you should be driving it and not driving you, you know, you should find the technology that suits your need in the lesson. And some of these, you know, this was in, in the context of a, of a you know, short workshop, and we, we pile it on you guys when you come to us for, you know, we, we try to get that content in there for you and, and get you comfortable doing some of these things. And so, you know, they didn't have a lot of time to develop some of these. Uh, but so a lot of these things, you know, you could actually do in PowerPoint with a voiceover. You put, you know, just change the slides and do a voiceover and put it up on the Internet for your students, however you want to do it. Uh, but you know, you need some better things. You want to look at some more. And she what? laid that out really well for the entry document. It had on there all the expectations, what they were expected to do. So all of that was brought up during that part of her PBL. Uh, can I talk to you about the Gila? Well, can we do? Let me do this sure one first. Let me do one more, then I'll turn it over to Delilah for a while. Oh. I'm not the oh, it's not a touch screen. Duh. <laughs> I love this one. Uh, this it is. Doesn't have sound. 
history of social studies teacher. But she essentially lays out, you know, like the whole breadth of human history in this one little video. I mean, I just kind of love that one, you know, I mean, because essentially what she does in this is, like, she brings them up to date, you know, I mean, I, I can't remember what she was, in the end, this has something to do with Mesopotamia and, and a couple other specific regions, and and that's the cultures that they're going to be looking at in, in, in you know, the upcoming semester. But I love the fact that she brings them up to speed by giving them the whole history of, of human development from climbing down out of the trees on, you know, until we hit this spot in time where she stops it. You know, and that, now that's what we're going to look at, you know. Uh, I thought that was kind of clever. And like I say, remember, these are, these are several years old, you know, and we, we're pushing them in a workshop. I mean, a little bit of video in there doesn't hurt, you know. Uh, you'll notice that there's an awful lot of, you know, grabbing music and, and images off the internet. And, you know, I'm not going to go to battle over fair use or what's not fair use or whatever, but your teachers, you're doing it in a small, you know, class of people. I, I think you fall under fair use pretty handily, and, and you can kind of do, yes, sir? So the idea, I'm a little confused, the idea that the students work with the teacher developing the concept of the way The teacher, okay, the teacher did that. I, I like to pull students out and, and make them little actors in my play like these guys, you yeah, know. I thought that was pretty good. And, 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 you know, as an engagement piece. No, no, your students aren't dictating what you're teaching them. I mean, uh, no, no, I'm not dictating it, but say that, like, I, I do Rockets, too. Okay. Project. Why I say, you can understand this by Is that what we're doing here? Well, you know, I, I, we're doing two different things. Like, that entry piece is really just meant as an engagement piece to introduce the topic, you know, hopefully get them thinking of these ideas, what do we know, what do we need to know kind of thing. Now, as, as a, a documentation tool, you know, it's, here again, with, with the engineering design process, what we do, you know, invariably with the rockets of school developments and history, you know, next thing I know, they're building these, you know, everybody's, you know, assumption that next year's rocket it's going to be more ambitious than this year's rocket. Bigger, better, faster, you know, and I get guys like this over there breaking the sound barrier with these big honking rockets. And, you know, I feel a little responsibility there. So we make their students do a present. I make everybody do a presentation anyway on their project prior to building it. And they should be able, you know, there's a couple of sterling rules I have in there. They better be able to justify every design choice I ask them about, you know, and, and, to, to demonstrate that that's the best choice they can make out of you know, what they eliminated. And they better be able to predict this before, before they build it. Because we don't want to build these big hawking rockets, you know, that, that, you know, or exceeding mock and, you know, going well on up there, you know. Uh, without, you know, them being able to assure me that it's going to fly, you know, in a stable fashion. So here again, they can use that video as part of that presentation to convince me, you know. I mean, it's propaganda piece, so there's, a variety of things there's lots of things you can do with it, and we're going to kind of cover some of the tools, so I think that might give you some ideas, too, about using them. Okay. Oh, so she's got one more. I know it's an excellent question, because what we have done, we have given you a variety of different things to just consider. 
with, uh, with what Dr. Chandler showed you at the very beginning. That's how you can involve your students and get them involved in that process. There's also just doing your entry document by video to get students engaged and get them excited. Um, you know, none of us in education get paid as much as we should. I am like the biggest advocate for making sure that teachers are paid extremely, extremely well. But when I was teaching, one of my biggest thrills was, you know that second, and you all know that minute, when you have them, you excite them, and they don't want to leave. And you're like, I'm gonna have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> sorry, so sorry. <laughs> Lived for those minutes. I mean, that was the thing that that just you know I loved so very much. This is one of the best when you're doing your entry, and you guys know when, with your PBLs, you want to give them just enough information to get them excited, but you don't want to give them the answers quite yet with for everything that they're gonna need to know. This is one of the best ones that I have seen. Um, the only problem with it is when they made it, it goes very, very quickly, okay? So you have to read kind of fast, but it is about Henrietta Lacks. So if you know about Henrietta Lacks, it's about some, her genes, and it is an, it's an, what the, with the little teaser that they give here, it really gets kids excited to learn more about her. And if you're going to do that, it's over on the corner, sorry. Technically challenged little friend. There you go. Maybe. Or not, maybe it's tired. This is no. She leaves behind a scientific discovery. She must have not had very much money, and she was very basically in a, you know, in a pauper's grave, and then what is this about the, the hospitals trying to make money, or, or what? And the kids are excited, and they're running to the libraries. People are like, the librarian's like, what are you doing down there? Because they are coming and like peeling off the shelves on my books. I'm like, well, I should have warned you beforehand, but that's the kind of excitement and engagement that we want out of our students. So, how many, and you don't have to raise your hand, I am technically. And I will tell you this, as you have seen no, really for is. yourself, <laughs> um, I was banned from the coffee machine in my prior school district. <laughs> and I worked at the administration office. All the secretaries got together and said, we spend more time trying to fix what you break. If you'll just give it to us, we'll take care of it, OK? So I tried, but when I touch things, they just zip and zap and smoke and go off. So. If you were worried about, there is no way I could make one of these, there is no way I could teach one of my students or all of my students to make one of these, there is hope for you, my friends, because I made some of these. And if I did it, I can guarantee you, you can do it. Let me see if I can get us hooked up here. This one is from Powtoons. These are very simple to make. Like I said, if I can make it, you too can make it. Can get it to come up now. It's fighting me, John. I want to go. I think it's your magnetic personality. It is. It's it's zapping out my machine. <laughs> yeah. There. Let me see. Well, let me. Here, let me do this. I had it up a second ago. Don't laugh at me. See, I have to work with this all the time. He makes fun of me. Okay. I'm For those of you that. Uh, Delilah did get one of these. Delilah really kind of went above and beyond the call of duty. It takes several of these. I, she has these little yes, things does. broken out into video production tools, various kind of guides and articles, and uh, you know existing collections that you can snag stuff out of and production tools. And I think, well, I was amazed when she came up with that because 
these things have proliferated online. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, here's one. <laughs> Yay! Um, I did this one. It is on STEM education. And it took, it did not take me very long. I was just playing with it. Uh, yeah, really. Yeah. There it, it worked. <laughs> when I left here, this is not me. It's just, it's tired. It's going off the internet. Okay, on it. It's so good. It's streaming it's well. It's very... We got kind of, I've got kind of a crappy connection in my room, too, that does that. Bless your heart. I'm probably not watching it. Trying to show you you, too, talk. can do this, and you see my finished production. Okay. Okay. It's basically putting in your different pictures. You can press and it will put it together for you and it has a whole bank of different music that you can select. With your, and in a minute, if you don't have one of these, I'll come by and bring you one. But the first two pages of this, we wanted to make sure that we gave you different video tools. So there's some, and it gives a little descriptor about all the different tools that are out there that you can use to create videos, that your students can use to create videos, okay? Because once you videotape it, you can't just have it sitting on your iPad. You have to do something with it. So you can put it into one of these fancy little programs. Here's my other one, if I can get to it. Bless your hearts. I know. It's a thing we say, or I always say, you can say anything about anybody if you follow it up with bless your heart. So if you're all going, bless her heart, and just see her in there, just trying away. And I'm gonna have to come back to this one because we don't wanna, this one was really, okay, there it is, it's loading. I'm just not being patient. And I had them already pulled up, but then they just went away. Loading awesomeness. Loading, loading awesomeness, yeah. is that what it says? Yeah. Okay, well you would think it would just play. Oh, it's still, it's loading awesomeness. And it knows loading me. slowly. Oh and loading <laughs> slowly. So why it's loading slowly? We'll go ahead and look at this. So for your first two pages on here, you have different programs with the descriptors that you can use. Then right over here, I've put some very helpful guides and articles for you, okay? There are some that, that first one that's on there, K-12 Tech Tools, it goes through there and it gives you a wonderful selection as you go through of different tech tools you can use, how to use them. There's Movie Making Sense and Making Movies on the Web, a guide for teachers. Some excellent resources there. There are other library banks out there on videos other than YouTube. And on the back here, I have video collections for you. These are places that you can go and you can get videos on just about anything that you would need. If you want to get, if you need to take a snippet, if your students are making a video and they need a section of something, they can go there and then edit it. But this is a wonderful place for them to be able to go. Um, and then on the very back are some production tool ideas. And I'm going to show you some of those in just a minute. Oh, the awesomeness is now loaded. Yay. Stuff that's, that's out there on the net and your videos are a lot easier. You know, the one, one of the things that Adamoto has too is uh, this to, 
to Delilah, I think it's a plus, but to me it's a negative on it. It's like, it has like these little, you know, preset formats, you know, that, you know, are a little cutesy for me, you know, I mean, I, how can I how can I maintain my curmudgeonly demeanor? You know, if I if you know I've got little you know little bears dancing behind me and stuff. You know, but but here again, that's up to you. I, you know, the, no the thing is, is bears on you the, you the find video. you find the, you find a tool that fits your teaching need and you, and what you're trying to convey to your students. And you know, the rest takes care of itself. Uh, video maker uh, or the movie maker that, that I have on my PC. I mean, years ago we used to do stuff with video and. We had that high dollar Adobe Premiere. I think we spent like 10 grand for this this program, and like, oh god, it was a nightmare. And this thing, our, you know, the movie maker now, you just drop in segments, you know, you know, drop in sound on top of it, you know, manipulate those things around, cut them, splice them, just do all kinds of amazing stuff. There are all these effects built into it. it takes about 10 minutes to figure it out, you know. Take your kids about two minutes, you know. Uh, here again, you can get as professional as you want, you can spend as much time as you want. Now we realize you don't want to spend all that much time, but here again, this idea that a picture is worth a thousand words, well, what's the video worth, you know? Not much if you don't do it right, but I mean, here again, you can pack in an awful lot of, a lot of information, you know? And I like doing that. I, you know, Delilah likes a little mystery in hers. I like packing, you know, because my background is engineering, you know? We're, we're building things in my classes, by golly, you know? And I like to pack in all this stuff that they have to tease out. Because that's what they're gonna find out in the real world, you know. And, you know, like our Mrs. Van Flatlander, you know, she she's a little ditzy and off in La La Land, but you know, turned out she had a lot of pull with those people. And you know, I mean sometimes that's a that's a key factor in in you know the success of a project, whether Miss Van Flatlander is happy in the end, you know. So if you know, we did what got her F chord and maybe had a little odd this going on with how we ever clacked the thing, you know. You know, I've got a feeling she'd been happy with that. But you know, that's what I want our students to understand. It's not always just cut and dried for you. We have some video planning tools for you. And like I said, you'll find them on here. But you're not, you know, you just don't want to put the camera in the hands of your children and say, go forth and produce wonderful things. We want to make sure that we give them the tools. If you'll go on either one of these, like I said, they're in here. It's kids' vids and teaching ideas, like the camera action that has it on here. They have in there scripting tools. They have on their storyboards. They have all different things that the students can lay out or that you, if you're putting something together, you can lay out so that you know exactly how you want it to look and, and how you want it to go. And there's that writing like activity again. You know, I mean, they're using the same sort of mental processes to develop that video now with these scripting tools as, as they are writing a term paper, you know. And we want to get them in the habit of thinking like that. And if we're having, if we are creating, because with 21st century skills, if we are expecting our students to be able to, to create these things, we need to be able to be modeling those things for them in the classroom, that they're things that we've created. No matter how sad sometimes they are, <laughs> you saw mine wasn't, you know, I'm not going to win any kind of Academy Award for any of those, but um, it was a good starting place for some of those. But um, some questions, as you're having your students produce these things, some questions that you're going to ask yourself or that others may ask you, how can I assign grades to products that take many forms? Video is something that takes a different form. How are you going to be able to assess those if you're having students create them? Another, if uh, products take many different forms, how can I assure that my students' grades are fair? Mama's going to want to know that too, okay? Um, and how can I assess products in ways that support my students' awareness of learning outcomes and their own learning progress? One of the best resources I've found out there is DigiTales, or Diggy, Diggy Tales. <laughs> Diggy tails. And with that, what it is, it is rubrics. You go through, you say what, you, you give it, it has a framework. You outline what kinds of things you're looking for on there. You click them and it will produce some ideas for you to be able to go in and, and, and put your rubric together. Let's just follow that link, can we? You know, let's not even try that because we only have about three minutes and we know that this thing will probably explode. Actually, I minutes. love this tool. You know, there again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we had to wait for that other guy. No. Anyway, anyway, I mean, I love this tool because here again, it's rubrics on rubrics on rubrics, and you go in and you sort of, all right, you know, what are my teaching goals with this? What do I want the kids to take away from this? 
You know, I mean, you, college students turn into a bunch of little lawyers on you if you're not careful, you know. I mean, you know, and they, they sometimes they show up with real lawyers, you know, I mean, if you're really not careful. But still, you know, it's only fair to, you know, to, to give them a very clear idea of how you're assessing them and, and you know, what you're assessing them on, you know, what kind of weights you're placing on different different aspects of the assignment. Because these are, you know, when you start getting into the project-based classroom, now you got some complexity going on there, you know, and there are all kinds of different aspects of the assignment. And as we get better with it, we start seeing the little things we like and, you know, and the little things we could care less about, you know. Uh, you know. And uh, I think it's only fair that we tell them up front how they're being assessed, particularly if they're bringing in multimodals of, of communicative activity, you know, and, 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 and ways of, of, you know, talking to us. And, and really, you start putting these things up on the internet and you're talking to the whole world and you're talking across time and space and it's, it's just boggles my imagination. We looked at some different ways that you can use these. You can use them for entry documents, you can produce them, you can have your students produce them. But also with project, Dr. Chandler talked about this with project documentation. Whenever they are working on that project, they can use video to trace every step of, of, of what they did, the meetings that they had, their thought processes, their building, their, their testing, all the way through. And it's very helpful that you can also use those to put those into portfolios and resume items. Because we know more and more, especially the 21st century skills, that we are going to start looking at online portfolios. That is one of the ways that we're going to be assessing those 21st century skills. So it's good to have those kinds of things as archives to put in there. Um, also, with project presentation, we want our students to be able to articulate well. We want them to be able to communicate with different modes, not only with their speaking, but if they are uh, presenting something or creating something. That is another way of communication. And experimental procedures and results, just that basic going through and re recording what happened and then what was the effect and going back then. They can use that as a tool to help them as they're going through the different processes. Do you guys remember like your freshman labs when you were in college, you know, like the chemistry, like, all those things were just so dull as dirt. And they were always attached to like 101 classes and, and it's just like, just shoot me, you know? And mine never came out like the TA little manual said it was supposed to come out. You know, I mean, you get a video of these things and now you can go back and you can look at them and say, well, looky here. You missed step three, you know, or whatever. You know, I mean, you didn't put in the reactant or whatever, you know, but here again. Or they maybe come up with something that just boggles your mind and you don't have an explanation for it. It's like, now we got to find out the answer to this. And a great way to document all aspects, but particularly things that you want hard documentation on, you know, like science, you know, I mean, as scientists, we want to. This is the difference between scientists and engineers. Scientists, we want to remove ourselves from the from from what we're observing. Yeah, you know, we don't want to influence it. You know. Engineers, we just keep tinkering with it until we get the results we want. You know, and here again, your students can demonstrate that they're doing the kind of behaviors you're trying to instill in them, like tinkering or not tinkering. You know, depending on what what you're teaching. Well, it is hard to believe, but our time has, our time together is, is ending. Um, make sure that I know that the sign-in sheet is somewhere out there. Please make sure that you've signed in before you leave so that you can get credit for this, that they're picking these up afterward. And I want to thank you. The, the takeaway from this that we wanted to make sure that you understood was that videos can be used in a variety of capacities. We wanted to put in your hands the tools that you could use to go back and not only um, enable yourself, but to be able to help your students learn these things. And we appreciate so much you coming. We have extras. If anybody didn't get one, please feel free. And we appreciate you coming. And please go forth and create some videos. Oh, I got you.